Good evening and uh, welcome to this online lecture titled The Medium is the Message, the Art of European Posters. I'm George uh, Stilianou and I'm your host to, uh, for this evening. Uh, our guest speaker is independent curator and writing, uh, writer Catherine Flood. She joins us uh, from the UK. Good evening, Catherine. Hi, nice to be here. Nice to have you over. Just two words um, on the format before we start. We will be starting with a brief introductory speech from Periklis Christodoulou, uh, curator at the House of European History. And uh, Ms. Flood will uh, then speak for about 40 minutes and uh, a question and answer session will uh, follow after that. So please leave any questions, comments, uh, remarks you might have in the comments uh, section and we will pick them up uh, during the Q&A. Periklis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the first online lecture of the series Europe on Posters. The series complements a new exhibition at the House of European History. On April 30, we opened our fourth temporary exhibition, When Walls Talk. It tells the diverse and engaging story of posters in European history. The illustrated poster was born in Europe in the late 19th century, reflecting an increasingly commercialized world and conflicting political ideologies. Posters are ephemeral, produced for a specific moment, yet many elements are recycled and reanimating cultural memory today. From the propaganda of the world wars and the cold war to the explosion of cultural exchange, tourism, and the emergence of multi-vocal social movements after the second world war, the exhibition reveals complex layers of European division and unity through a selection of posters from our own collection. They reflect the development and transformation of the public sphere in European cities. I invite you warmly to visit the exhibition in our premises or learn more about it on our website. We tried to present both history and posters from a different angle. The visitors who enter the exhibition encounter the following phrase from an essay that Susan Sontag published in 1970. A poster is like a miniature of an event, a quotation, from life or from high art. Indeed, it has been an eventful journey navigating through many posters until we reach the selection of around 140 that can be seen in the exhibition. Our speaker today will take us with her on an inspiring journey about the ways in which posters have harnessed and shaped ideas about art, design and society in Europe throughout the major social and political shifts of the last 100 years. I'm very pleased to welcome Catherine Flood. Catherine is a curator whose work spans contemporary creative practices and design history. Formerly curator of posters at the Victoria and Albert Museum, she has published widely on the subject of poster history. She is also the curator of a number of major exhibitions on themes of design and society. I hope that you will enjoy her talk. Dear Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So as we've just heard, um, the exhibition um, demonstrates how posters have participated in many of the social, political and cultural forces that have shaped Europe over the past hundred years. And they can therefore tell of perhaps quote, many different kinds of history from wars to tourism to social movements. But since this is the first talk in, in the series in conjunction with the exhibition, I want to think about the meaning of the poster as a medium. The title of the talk, um, The Medium is the Message, is a famous statement by Marshall McLuhan, um, a pioneer of the study of communication. And by this, he meant um, that each medium, independent of the content it communicates, has its own intrinsic effects, and it's, which, yeah, which is um, its own unique message. Um, and he argued that when a new media arrives, um, it can reshape who we are as individuals and as a society. And since I'm an art and design curator, I want to focus in particular um, on how the poster has provided an intersection for ideas about art, technology and social change um, and ideas that we're still negotiating today. So the modern poster um, was the child of Europe's 19th century industrial cities. It presupposed the mass audience of the urban crowd and the display surfaces 
of public space, streets, railway stations, and the hoardings that covered continuous building work and urban expansion. It inhabited the sphere of democratic communication and, and answered the industrial impetus to sell more and more goods. It was itself an object of industrial production. And for all these reasons, it embodied the essence of modernity. It also heralded a more image-led culture. Posters were initially mostly text-based and monochrome, as you see in this painting of London from 1835. But towards the end of the 19th century, advances in colour lith lithographic printing enabled large-scale, vividly coloured sheets that integrated text and image. The inner, inner landscape of the imagination and the outer landscape of the environment became subject to a stream of completely new kinds of image competing for attention and changing how people perceive their world. It was the French artist and printmaker Jules Charest who first tested the potential, the, um, the potential of the medium as an artistic expression. He drew directly on the printing surface rather than having a technician transfer the image. And thereby, he was able to achieve autograph autographic and gestural lines. And his fluency with the printing technology also allowed him to achieve dazzling um, colour effects, as you see in this poster, um, promoting the dance dancer Loe Fuller, who was famous for her use of diaphanous costumes that were illuminated by multicoloured electric lights. And inspired by Sherry, a number of avant-garde Paris-based artists, such as Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, turned to designing posters and were attracted by the opportunity to experiment technologically and to work outside the institutions of art. Toulouse Lautrec worked with colour lithography um, to create strikingly modern images, um, expressive lines, flat planes of colour and unusual perspectives um, inspired in part by Japanese prints, but also by the kind of inherent qualities of colour lithography. But above all, posters were an opportunity to engage with the subject matter of everyday life. While the academic art of the day prioritised highly finished paintings on grand historical and mythological subjects, posters required the artist to depict ordinary people and communicate with them directly in the spaces of daily life. This is a poster by the realist painter Alexandra and Theophar Steinlin, and it advertises a poster printer and links the medium to the vitality of street life and the modern urban crowd with its kind of transgressive so social mix. Um, you can see the capitalist together with the laundry woman, the fine lady, the worker. Um, and it kind of sort of captures the idea that posters at, at this time were a little bit edgy. Posters advertised entertainments and the products of a growing consumer society. But after the lifting of censorship in France um, and a new law on the freedom of the press, there was also an outpouring of politically focused artistic and literary journals and the posters that promoted them, which flooded the, the city with social discourse. And this is a poster um, for a feminist newspaper um, by woman artist Clementine Helene Defoe, showing women, women literally kind of looking to new horizons. And she puts the figure of the artist who's looking directly at the viewer right at the centre of this politically charged city. So although the poster developed as a commercial medium, we can see how it quickly became a magnet um, for ideas to do with um, freedom of expression and um, both artistically and, and politically. And thanks to their novelty and vibrancy, posters were soon hailed as a bold new art form and a collectible commodity. Posters became the subject of exhibitions, publications and museum collections. And on the left, we see a Sherry poster on sale in a print shop, and on the right, a poster advertising an exhibition of posters. More than any other kind of ephemera, posters have bridged the gap between high art and mass culture. And they're one of the few forms of design relating to the few forms of design kind of that are consistently collected by art and design museums that kind of relate to public life rather than to kind of um, private consumption. But for many um, of the turn of the century observers, the real significance of the poster lay on its, in its impact on the public spaces it colonised. And in this respect, the unchecked spread of posters across cities frequently 
evoked moral and aesthetic panic. Anxieties about industrialization, the democratization of consumption, and the degeneration of taste and national character. And that came from both conservative and progressive voices. And if we look back um, at the poster I showed you at the beginning, um, the artist is drawing a parallel between the unruliness of poster display and the potentially threatening nature of the urban underclass. In the bottom left-hand corner, um, we can see a, a pickpocket um, at work. And surprisingly, similar statements are still expressed today um, when graffiti and fly posting are described as a magnet for antisocial behaviour. And in this um, painting, the kind of neoclassical dome of St Paul's Cathedral is almost kind of drowned out in um, advertising posters. Um, and you can also see theatre posters um, advertising the um, plays about the destruction um, of Pompeii. And so he's seeming to suggest that posters are threatening the whole idea um, of the civilised city, city. And you can see here um, some of the solutions um, that answer this urge to rationalise and tidy up poster advertising. And this is um, the iconic Lifas con column um, in Berlin, um, which was replicated in France as well. Um, a column um, specifically for um, displaying and containing posters. Um, and here there's a proposal for rationalising um, poster display in London. Social reformers argued that beautifully designed and displayed posters um, could improve the quality of people's lives and train their taste by acting as an art gallery of the streets. A movement called Art à la Rue of radical art artists, architects, uh, mainly in Paris and Brussels in the 1890s and 1900s, aimed specifically to bring art closer to the working class. And um, the architect, um, Franz Jordan, said, posters could bring art to ordinary people and help uplift their aesthetic as well as moral taste. And it was their intention to shift art's kind of sphere of action away from the elitist museum towards the public street. And um, the idea being that moral and civic harmony could be achieved by integrating art with everyday life. And it's interesting because many of the same arguments that were being applied to the 19th century museum about kind of creating very orderly and rational displays um, were replicated in these discussions of the street. So posters kind of entered into the museum, but um, this idea of the art gallery of the street kind of turned the museum itself inside out. And in the early 20th century, design and reform movements such as the Deutsche Werkbund in Germany and later the Bauhaus focused on promoting a closer alliance between art and industry and aimed to dissolve the boundary between art and its practical application in everyday life. Paying attention to the artefacts of mass consumption, including advertising and publicity, um, and a pared down kind of visual language that embodied that. Embodied that um, kind of added up to a kind of ut utopian belief um, in the machine to kind of transform the world and the poster um, could com communicate that um, through its content, but also through the mechanical means through which it um, through which it delivered that. And indeed, it was through prestigious advertising projects, um, some of which um, you can see here, that the public were introduced to the visual language of modern art movements such as Cubism, Futurism, Constructivism, surrealism. In the aftermath of the carnage of World War I, the belief that the world needed to be fundamentally rethought gave momentum to these kind of ideas that the human condition could be healed and reshaped through new approaches to art and design. In the countries that emerged victorious from the war in Europe, the emphasis continued to be on design reform. But in countries that underwent revolution, there was a search for new artistic forms and media capable of projecting revolutionary ideas and rousing the masses to the cause. The war had demonstrated what a powerful propaganda tool the poster was, but in the context of new socialist and communist states, it was also seized on by artists as a legitimate and tangible way for them to participate in revolution, to bridge the gap between artists and workers and to connect radical artistic experiments in modern art with radical politics on the ground. 
and to reimagine the role of art and the artist in society in the process. In the context of socialist, socialist revolutions, technically, technologically produced posters were capable both of keeping pace with the events and of standing in opposition to bourgeois notions of art for art's sake and the, fetish, the fetishizing of the kind of individual artwork as something unique and monetarily valuable because posters, of course, are produced in multiples. In Hungary, after the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, artists played a prominent role in supporting both the liberal revolution in 1918 and the equally short-lived Communist Republic of the Soviets. One of the main ways they did so was through designing posters. Already in 1916, Lajos Kasak, a leading figure of the Hungarian avant-garde, had written a manifesto that explored the aesthetic and ethical synergy between posters and modern art. And he urged artists to embrace the poster as a medium that was easily adaptable to the pared down visual language of modern art movements. And also crucially pointed out that the poster was something that was never merely decorative, but that had in its very nature, to quote him, the properties of an agitator. The poster was a way simply for art to become activist. And this is one of the most famous poster images from that period. The Hammer Wielding Red Man by Hungarian artist Mile Biro, in which the figure appears to break through the frame of the poster into the physical space of the spectator. A metaphor, if you like, for art stepping off the walls and into the current events and the street. And on the right, um, there's a photo of it on the streets in Budapest that demonstrates another aesthetic value of the poster in revolutionary contexts which was to instantaneously cover over the architectural forms of, Euro forms of European cities that were so closely associated with the old regimes and to create a new and dynamic visual environment. In Germany as well, during the Weimar Republic, the, well, the, rather, the Weimar Revolution of 1918, the provisional government employed avant-garde artists to produce modern posters calling on citizens to participate in the first democratic elections to the new National Assembly. And these are works by two expressionist painters, uh, Max Pechstein and Cesar Klein, who belong to an association of artists, writers, architects and musicians called the November Group in reference to the month of the revolution which, as the name suggests, was a group of artists who supported the ideals of the revolution and the idea of a synergy between artistic and political freedom. On the left is a pamphlet by Pechstein titled To All Artists, calling on artists to work with the state to help shape the new republic and depicting an artist burning kind of with sacred duty. And on the right is one of the posters um, showing individual citizens um, in different regional costumes and professional clothing, stepping forward to proclaim their allegiance to the new republic. Um, it, they're standing in a landscape that's pulsating with dynamic energy. In a, in a departure from commercial advertising, these posters are rendered in the gestural style of German Expressionism, which aimed at revealing an inner state rather than a realistic representation. Both the government and the artists believe that the expressionist style was in itself full of emotion, an emotional urge to action and would have an inherent appeal to the revolutionary masses. The posters certainly achieved huge exposure on the streets. However, contemporary assessments of the campaign suggested that the ordinary people to whom the posters were addressed felt that these distorted figures were caricaturing and mocking them. Regardless of the democratic intentions of the artists, they were perceived as a cultural elite who were patronising the workers. But probably the most far reaching experiment in putting radical art in the service of the state and, and attempting to align art with ideology was constructivism in Soviet Russia in the 1920s. Put briefly, the constructivist artists sought to replace the idea of composition based on the personal intuition and inspiration of the artist with a scientific and technological approach to the construction of forms and utilitarian objects that would contribute to the construction of a new society. And this included forms of communication and propaganda um, from posters to cinema and theatre. And these are designed by um, constructivist artists um, 
Gustav Klotis and Alexander Rodchenko for agitprop kiosks, lightweight, dynamic communi communication devices designed to spread propaganda that variously combine screens for projecting newsreels, bookshelves, platforms for human orators and boards for posters. So if the Litfast column um, integrated advertising aesthetically into the capitalist city, this was its revolutionary counterpart. Photomontage um, became an important technique um, of constructivist poster design, as you see in these two posters. Um, the use of photographic elements um, integrated the world of the machine with the world of art and emphasised the role of the poster designer as a technological producer rather than the autonomous creator of an image. But it was also a concession to the Soviet government that was becoming increasingly hostile to abstraction in art and argued, like the critics of the Weimar posters that we just saw, that to be socially useful, art for the masses had to be easily intelligible by them. The photomontage was a compromise um, towards greater storytelling and realism. But for Stalin, of course, um, that didn't go far enough. The functional role of art simply meant that it should offer unambiguously positive images of life in the Soviet Union, rendered in a true to life style. And in 1932, socialist realism um, was made the official prescribed style of the Soviet Union. The poster remained central to the idea of art in communist society, but the uneasy alliance between utopian avant-garde art and the state was severed. And Klitsis, um, whose poster you see here, who also designed um, the kiosks, was arrested and ex executed in 1938 during one of the Stalinist purges, accused of harbouring anti-communist ideals. And ironically, of course, um, the Soviet style of socialist realism was mirrored by fascist propaganda in Nazi Germany and the Nazi common condemnation of avant-garde art as degenerate. And so what the state really was interested in was not um, participation of artists, um, but having complete control of the narrative. After the Second World War, um, the ubiqu ubiquitous presence of advertising on the one hand and propaganda on the other broadly symbolized the political divide of the cold war in urban space in both cases however the artistic nature of the mainstream the artistic nature of mainstream posters declined in the second half of the 20th century in the west modernism remained the de rigueur style of graphic design and advertising but was mostly devoid of its socially utopian sense of purpose and increasingly, the new science of marketing replaced the vision of the individual designer. In the Soviet Union, meanwhile, socialist realist posters eventually became a tired trope that kind of endlessly um, rehashed imagery. But an important exception to this was in the Polish Republic, People's Republic, where graphic poster art flourished to such an extent that Poland was dubbed the placated from um, the land of posters. As in the Soviet Union, posters were one of the few outlets for art permitted and sponsored by the communist state. Unlike the Soviet Union, however, aesthetic control from the government was surprisingly loose and artists were not required to adhere to socialist realist style. Apart from a general brief to re reject Western ide ideals, they were left to their own devices especially in the design of posters for cultural events that were intended to boost morale by injecting artistic colour and vitality into the post-war landscape. At the same time, since there was no market economy, posters were not subject to the same pressure to sell as they were in capitalist economies. Relatively free from both ideological and social pressures, the best artists in Poland devoted their talents to the poster and developed a visual approach based on painterly gesture, handcrafted typography, humour, graphic metaphor and delusion. And that came to be known as the Polish Poster School and achieved a great acclaim internationally. Posters were intensely aesthetic, um, but what the government didn't grasp was their potential for subversion. Through their use of metaphor, Polish artists were able to create multi-layered images 
that satisfied the censors but carried hidden messages and subtext um, and turned the rules into a kind of subtext of opposition. So, for example, um, Sulka's circus poster here um, has been interpreted um, as Polish society looking up in kind of, sort of longing, uh, longing anticipation of freedom. The poster on the right um, by Roman Sishnevich shows a figure contained and suffocating in an armoured shell. It's promoting the opera, The Prisoner, um, and it conveys the kind of pessimism and sense of deception and entrapment kind of prevalent um, in Cold War Europe. And so it's the kind of it's the psychological tone of the poster um, that becomes a comment. So Polish poster artists reclaimed the poster as a form of individual expression, but also of subversion. Another arena in which the poster flourished in these years was within grassroots activist movements. Whereas once the poster has symbolized a technological cutting edge in communication, by the late 60s, political groups with few resources and no access to mainstream media we're using the poster as a cheap, immediate and low tech way of producing their own messages and being able to represent themselves. And in this, the students involved in the uprisings in Paris in May 1968 that nearly brought down the authoritarian government of Charles de Gaulle led the way. Students at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts occupy the print studio at the art school and set up the Atelier Populaire on the People's Press creating a stream of bold, rapidly produced monochrome designs that were posted on the streets of Paris in support of the anti-government strikes. Like the avant-garde 50 years before, their approach went beyond the production of propaganda to theorising and experimenting with an activist role for art within society. Some of their posters function as manifestos and make clear connections with some of the ideas we've already seen for rev a re revolutionary reinvention of art within a socialist struggle. The poster on the left um, proclaiming fine art is over, revolutionary art is born, recalls the proclamation of the constructivist Alexi Gan that art is dead. The poster in the middle, Beauty in the Street, has a similar energy to Biro's Hammer Man, a red figure propelled out of the poster and onto the street, this time with a cobblestone rather than a hammer as the means of smashing the system. And that, of course, is a reference to the ripping up of cobblestones in Paris during the demonstrations to create barricades, which gave rise to one of the most famous slogans of May 1968, Sous les pavés la plage, the beach beneath the paving stones, a witty reference to the exposure of sand on which the granite cobblestones are laid and a poetic call to disrupt the banality and oppressiveness of everyday life and to imagine new ways of living and being. But ephemeral posters like barricades were temporary forms used to disrupt the monumental institutional infrastructure of city streets and to create spaces and time for congregation that's allowed for different dreams and desires. And a key idea in the Atelier Populaire's approach to activist art was participation, um, as referenced in the poster on the right, um, the verb to participate. They wanted to collapse the division between the artist and the spectator, asserting that art should be something you do rather than something you look at and something that you do collectively. And in that respect, printing posters was an ideal activity since it demanded collective working and was done in a way that integrated intellectual and manual labour. And the content of the posters was decided um, in an assembly each morning um, at the Atelier Populaire through a process of direct democracy and everyone was involved in the process of production. Thanks in part to the inspiration of the Atelier Populaire, the hand-printed poster became part of the toolkit for a new wave of activist social movements around the world in the early 1970s, from feminism and gay rights to anti-racism and environmentalism. And these are two feminist posters that tackle um, the issue of the representation of women in society. 
One poster calls out the objectification of women's bodies through the Miss World Beauty Contest, while the other creates an empowering image of women getting angry, combating the idealisation of women's passivity. As with the Atelier Populaire, however, um, the process was as important as the posters themselves. And poster collectives and community print shops um, acted as prefigurative spaces. Um, the idea of prefigurative politics being that um, instead of um, kind of waiting for the revolution to happen, you start to live it in the here and now. We start to kind of build um, the new society within the shell of the old um, in small ways through um, how you live and relate to each other. And so kind of poster workshops, studios, collectives um, functioned as kind of mini counter institutions um, where people were able to kind of experiment um, with um, with new worlds. Um, and this happened um, in, in Britain, in France, um, throughout Europe, but also um, in Poland um, during the Solidarity Movement, um, especially in the period of martial law, um, when getting involved in underground printing presses was one of the principal ways in which people were actually able to still be involved in the work um, of political opposition. So it was it was the making of these posters as much as the posters themselves that enacted um, the politics. So what does the poster as a medium mean now? Certainly some of its agency has been absorbed by digital platforms. Social media has vastly extended the possibilities for self publishing. And we see many poster like forms such as memes that communicate through words and images. By simply captioning an image on our phones, we can all create a poster. On the other hand, um, it's led to a fragmenting of communication and has built echo chambers where we don't come into contact with opposing views um, or differing voices. And perhaps the most important attribute of the poster posted in the physical city has always been that it's unavoidable to everyone who passes it by. And that's why corporations continue to invest in outdoor advertising. And for activists as well, occupying public space um, remains vital. This is a hand-painted placard protesting against Putin standing for a third term as president back in 2012. Its presence on the street was hugely significant because it was the first LGBT flag, the rainbow flag, um, it was the first time that appeared in a demonstration um, in public in Russia. And Alexei Kisilev, um, its creator, later had to leave Russia and take um, political asylum in Spain. And it, but it also circulated online. And indeed, the genre of the hand-painted placard has enjoyed a resurgence thanks to social media. Witty texts and catchy images are ready-made memes, um, but with the added kind of sense of authenticity. Placards carried in demonstrations, however, are temporary interruptions in the city. Access to official the official apparatus of poster display is more exclusive than ever. As I mentioned at the beginning, there's always been an urge to tidy up and control poster display. And over time, this has led to a reduction of leg legitimate billboard space in our cities and a zero tolerance approach to fly posting which has pushed advertising um, space to a premium. Legal display sites are the preserve of those with big budgets. Otherwise, you're deemed beyond control, your message is torn down and you're criminalised. For most of us, our only way to express ourselves in the city is passively as consumers. And this mirrors the process of gentrification and its flip side, which is the privatisation of public space and social inc inclusion. And you can take the bus shelter as an example, um, since we've been talking about street, um, street furniture. Although bus shelters are a public amenity, they're built, owned and maintained by the billboard companies who sell advertising space on them. And their positioning can have more to do with the visibility of the poster display than the convenience of the passenger. While the often wholly inadequate seating and shelter they provide is designed to present loitering to prevent loitering or homeless sleeping. 
as such, build billboards, um, which were once the essence of a potentially transgressive urban modernity, have become the essence of neoliberal economies. As such a seemingly unquestionable part of the physical and mental landscape that we inhabit, that the spectacle of empty billboards during the pandemic as companies cancelled advertising campaigns was both revelatory and unnerving, especially in a moment of crisis when the billboard's continuous comforting promise of a better tomorrow through the things that we can purchase was replaced with empty voids. And in the words, words of one Instagram user who documented this phenomenon of empty billboards um, through a, an account called Life Without Billboards, um, he said, it's only on walking down a street devoid of advertising that you quickly realise how much of your subconscious is regularly dispatched to secretly work away on deciphering it in the background, an instinctive mental exertion that's subtly stressful. Deserted billboards are also the subject of a photographic series um, by the artist Rab Harling, carried out um, first in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis um, and updated again um, during the COVID pandemic. These are some of the images um, from that series. But both um, the Instagram account um, and this art project um, suggest something of a kind of sort of latent utopia in this sort of idea of the city um, without billboards. Um, and Rab Harling says, you know, as this archive has grown, I've come to realise it starts to capture what life would be like without billboards, um, a kind of utopia. Advertising composes a huge part of the elaborately signalled techno landscape we inhabit. It drowns people in fictions of every kind while trying to implant previously unknown desires in their psyches. Without all encompassing advertising campaigns that fight each other to do our thinking for us, what is urban experience like without its pervasive imposition on our thoughts? I'm sorry, that was the, um, that was the Instagram project. Um, Rab Harling um, has a similar um, view that kind of empty billboards kind of force us to imagine um, a city um, with a very different um, ideological underpinning. But a more active response um, to this situation is Brandalism, an international collective of artists who hijack ab advertising space and replace the official posters with artworks that protest against um, the corporate control of culture and space. And this, this is how they describe their pro um, process in their manifesto. We steal this space from capitalism and we give it back to you for free for the communication of possible futures. And these are a few examples of vandalism in practice in 2015 um, during the climate conference um, in Paris. So in the relation to the episodes that I've touched on in this talk, brandalism can be seen as belonging to a long line of activist artists who have used the poster to insist that another world is possible. So from the 19th century to the present day, the meaning of the poster has been bound up with tensions surrounding freedom of expression, technology, social change and political part participation. And it's been a battleground over the content and control of public space. And I'd argue, therefore, that the history of the poster is a subject of huge relevance to contemporary discussions of democracy in Europe and the challenges it faces. Wow. Catherine, <laughs> thank you so much. It, 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 it really was an amazing uh, insight into the world of posters, uh, both in terms of the words you used, but also the illustrations that you used to carry those words along. So truly fantastic. We've we've had uh, a few comments actually from our audience already uh, and a couple of questions as well. Uh, but honestly, I'm very impressed. So uh, this shows someone who's actually in love with what they do. So I, I was uh, the question that comes to my mind is how did you get started with this? Because it, it, it does show a passion for posters. Yeah, I mean, I 
um, initially trained as a historian, um, but one who was allowed to go off on lots of tangents um, using art. Um, but it was really um, when I arrived at the V&A um, as an assistant curator, um, the collection that I worked with um, was the poster and prints collection. And it was amazing. I was amazingly fortunate because um, the collect an American collector had just given his um, his life's work, his poster collection to the museum. And his particular interest was in propaganda posters, um, protest posters. Um, and so it was my job to go and write the captions for this exhibition. Um, and in the more re with the more recent material, I was able to kind of track down many of the the makers, so the um, the feminist posters that I showed, you know, I was able to go and meet those women and kind of hear firsthand about um, about what they were doing, and that's kind of what really sparked my interest in in political graphics. And then um, that's followed me kind of um, throughout. And in twenty fourteen, um, I co curated an exhibition called Disobedient Objects, which was about kind of how art and design is used within contemporary activist movements. So. Yeah, and it, I just think it's a um, working with within a museum. It's a kind of subject that is is very outward facing, um, and it kind of forces you to engage um, in different ways. And it's really noticeable in a museum if you give a talk about paintings. People generally kind of stand there quietly and listen. Whereas if you talk about posters, particularly ones that people have experienced through their life. Um, they'll generally kind of challenge you, jump in, give you their stories. So I guess you're also immediately answering a question uh, from uh, Matrina, who says they say so much with uh, so little text. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's asking whether they do manage to provoke uh, conversations am amongst the public. So I guess you just answer that one, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there was... Um... Going back to the kind of 1970s um, protest poster making, there was a lot of discussion about um, how you could design posters that didn't just um, replicate what mainstream advertising did with a different message. You know, could you actually communicate differently in a way that prioritised um, information rather than, you know, kind of sort of um, persuasion, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so. The, sometimes they attempted to make their kind of use of image and text a little bit more complex as this idea of can can posters um really engage with complexity rather than just the kind of the fast simple image that um we often accuse advertising particularly in political context of sort of dumbing down the political message uh, i mentioned that it was impressive and i wasn't the only one who was impressed uh certain images uh, from your presentation got stuck to, to uh, our audience's uh, minds. And, and Daria uh, particularly uh, focuses on, on uh, the images that you showed about uh, industrial heritage. And she says it made her think about uh, stamps she used to collect as a, as a child in mm -hmm. terms of, of format, graphics, ideas. Are there any links? So this, is, this was actually Daria's comment. And my question is, can we draw any links between the two? between stamps and posters? Is there something that connects them? Absolutely. Um, in fact, um, poster designers were very often stamp designers as well. Um, and a very famous um, British designer, Abraham Games, who was working in the kind of 40s and 50s, um, he would um, kind of always test a poster at stamp size because you know you were likely to see it across the street so um although they are kind of two very different scales um when you're thinking about poster design you're not necessarily going to be kind of standing immediately in front of it or close to it um and, and a project i've recently been involved in um looking at the graphics of solidarity in poland in the 80s um there was a huge um an outpouring of um printing stamps um as well as the kind of better known posters and um after the in, during the period of martial law um it was much harder to get away with printing or displaying a poster um, and so the underground stamps became a vital way in which um kind of imagery of solidarity was was kept alive so yeah i think there's a lot of um in many different contexts there's a lot of crossovers 
Mm -hmm. um, another comment from Carlos from Spain that uh, posters uh, had a huge political role also during the Spanish uh, Civil War. Um, <laughs> sorry? Absolutely. I was, um, I had to kind of, in order to kind of keep my talk in time, I had to cut out the Spanish Civil War, but. Um, Let's introduce it then. Amazing, <laughs> another amazing example. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Um, something, and um, obviously, you know, the posters were produced um, kind of on both sides. It was another moment where um, kind of artists sort of rushed to support a cause and often one that, you know, they felt very personally connected to. Um, but when we're thinking about these kind of issues of um, the poster and democracy, I remember always being struck by reading that um, during the Spanish Civil War, um, when the post um, poster designs were being produced, they would kind of sort of show them to the public um, and ask people to vote for which poster they wanted to be to have put into production. Um, mm -hmm. So you were actually including um, your audience kind of in that in that decision. Now, uh, can graffiti be viewed or classified as posters uh, um, in the art gallery in the street? Um, again, this is a question by Matrina. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, again, the sort of the two, the two really go together. Um, and if we think about solidarity in Poland, um, or um, the, there's a, an amazing example in the catalogue for this exhibition of um, graffiti on the walls in Romania. Um, it's sort of you know beginning of the events of kind of 1989. And so I think sometimes it graffiti kind of is that sort of a very, very raw and kind of basic sort of instinct to be able to put your message into into space and just do it, you know, without even kind of printing it. Um, so I've, I think, yeah, in terms of protest, they're very much part of the same part of the same urge. And I think, yeah, in um, in recent decades, um, a sort of flourishing of um, street art in Europe um, is definitely kind of um, been seen as an art gallery of the street and has mm -hmm. attracted some of the same um, excitement and condemnation as when the, when the poster arrived in Paris. <laughs> so, so the uh, ideological poster these days is not dead, huh? it's alive and kicking, I guess. That's Yeah, um, and in many, many different forms, I think. Um, you and know, graffiti is one of them, right? Yeah, definitely. And um, that's why I made the link. Yeah, and on to kind of, um, yeah, online as well. And as I kind of mentioned with the hand painted placards, um, you know, there are these kind of, sort of hybrid forms where, you know, a kind of a performance on the street that involves graphics um, can be very quickly kind of shared and, and amplified. Um, whereas in the past, you kind of, you amplified your message through, you know, a large print run. Um, now you can kind of, yeah, you have that that possibility. And of course, the other side of the ideological poster is kind of sort of more straightforward propaganda, and and that continues to to be invested in um, mm -hmm. or used. And I was kind of looking at images the other day in in Ukraine of kind of because I was thinking of this idea of empty billboards and sort of hiatus in advertising that you know billboards there have been turned into messages you know to the um to the russian army um telling them to go <laughs> speaking of propaganda um are artistic currents movements or how they are uh, used in propaganda uh in art how are they used in in, in posters Harry, sorry would you repeat the uh, like things like cubism uh, yeah. You know, artistic movements, are they used to, and in, in what extent, and how are they received by the broader public? Are they like something more uh, of an elitist, let's say, uh, art within a popular art? Uh, how, how would you describe yeah. it? I mean, in the first half of the 20th century, kind of, this was a huge argument, as I kind of, sort of alluded to, um, you know, whether abstraction or modernism in art, um, you know, was was something that was elitist, um, or because it was trying to kind of connect with, you know, the sort of contemporary sort of feelings, um, whether it was kind of sort of capable of um, representing everybody. Um, 
and I think, yeah, there was sort of different different conclusions. Um, I always like the example of the un London Underground, um, <laughs> where there was a you know, very famous um, long running poster campaigns, which kind of always went to the top artists of the day, gave them quite a lot of artistic freedom. Um, and it was, you know, it had a commercial purpose, but it was also seen as a form of art education. And it was through kind of posters that people became aware of these movements um and then there's also of course you know kind of simply sort of forms of pastiche you know surrealism is the movement that's kind of you know been most kind of drawn on um by sort of advertising and marketing um but i think what i've the posters that i find really interesting are the ones where um it's not just about a style it's about um artists actually trying to connect um you know the sort of the means of producing art the meaning of the medium and the movement and actually trying to sort of integrate that with with the mm -hmm. politics that's happening so it's not simply a style that's slapped onto something uh, Luca is taking us uh, to uh, to another road i know because people have different types of questions uh, she's reminding us of uh, Susan uh, Sontag, of, of what Susan Sontag said, the poster artist, she said, Susan Sontag, I mean, is usually a plagiarist. And plagiarism is one main feature of the history of poster aesthetics. Do you agree or disagree with this Susan Sontag statement? Um, I think broadly, yes, I would agree. Um, and I think, um, as someone said right at the beginning, that... Um, posters kind of they stick in our in our cultural memory um and the way that and also they very often um kind of draw on um fine art images and in order to kind of communicate um effectively emotionally they very often connect with images that we're already familiar with um so i think that is part of their part of their mechanism um, and the sort of fact that they exist in yeah in multiples and that you very often find as I said with the kind of um, the Atelier Populaire the the image of the red woman hurling the cobblestone you know it's it's mm. entirely different to Biro's image of the red hammer man but you know there's a kind of clear connection sort of repeating uh, images and I think particularly within social movements very often they sort of try to make those kind of genealogical sort of connections um, and kind of reference those those underpinnings. Yeah. And I think also in terms of the connection of um, posters to sort of socialist movements in particular. Um, yeah, there's the idea of trying to get away from the sort of the aura of the unique individual object and um, yeah, to to see art in all its senses as something a bit more kind of democratic. Catherine, we have about five minutes uh, left. I think I have time for another, maybe two more questions. Is that okay with you? Uh, first coming from Carlos, how would you uh, define the artistic political activism with the introduction of social media nowadays? Um, AG democratization of activism or just the spread of multitude of opinions? Um, I think it can be both. Um, when we did disobedient objects, um, we kind of used this phrase called um, hive design. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, um, what so social media has the ability to um, to kind of bring, yeah, hive design, swarm design, and um, to kind of sort of bring people together. And very quickly for um, an occupation or a protest camp, and very often that kind of sort of disperses again. Um, but I think within activist um, design, um, there has always been um, this sort of sharing of strategies. Um, there are many how to guides um, that have sort of been printed by activist movements, and the whole idea is that they record what they do, they pass it on to the next um, group in order to modify and use. So it's, um, it's a very sort of generous and iterative approach. And I think social media has kind of has sped that up um, 
but I think it probably happens most successfully when there's still some element of people meeting in a physical space. So the sort of social media acts as amplification and organization, but um, yeah, without the um, actual kind of physical meeting and creating and doing on the ground um, can very easily be a, yeah, just lots of people talking unconnectedly. The last thing I wanted to ask you, it's one of the questions I prepared, but I, I'm happy to see that another person, another member of the audience actually had the same uh, question for you. Uh, so if I were to ask you for one poster, oh, just gosh. one, <laughs> that comes to your mind when people speak of posters uh that sticks out in your memory which one would that be um i think it would have to be the solidarność solidarity poster that simply um simply has that incredible logo on it um Wh which one exactly the one that goes like uh the, the heart rate um no it's just the the logo itself ah, the logo itself okay very often you know you had a poster or a banner with just the logo and it you know it turns the word solidarity into an image of um people marching forward um and kind of united together um and you know i think it's being called you know one of the most successful pieces of political graphic design ever created and i think you know there's there's an argument for that um mm -hmm. And you know it worked at every possible scale. Um, it connected with many different um, sort of ideologies within um, Poland itself. And it could be the kind of the socialist marching. Um, it could be you know the kind of, sort of blood of martyred workers. It you know um, and also it, it resonated abroad. And so you know I, as a child, kind of watching events unfolding. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that... In Warsaw, you mean, I mean, dying. Personally. <laughs> Sorry? I... It's something that's stuck in my memory personally, yeah. as a, you know, as a child watching events on television or seeing, you know, Solidarity for Solidarity posters on the street in London. Mm -hmm. Had mm -hmm. a huge reach. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I mean, um, the image sometimes, the, the, uh, the words that, combined with the with with the image you know different people get like culturally speaking in my in my mind one of the posters i remember is jaws don't ask me why but you know just that huge snout the triangular teeth coming up and the swimmer and then above yeah. just one word jaws you know for me that was or uncle sam saying i want you yeah that's another one so and solidarność definitely yeah Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for this very interesting discussion. Is there anything you would like to, to add before we wrap it up? Um, no, just to, um, to thank you for giving me the space to talk about posters. <laughs> it's been really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'd also like to thank uh, the people, our people who work behind the scenes uh, so that this was uh, possible today. Uh, Nicola, Theodora, William, thank you all very much. And finally, a big thanks to all those who joined us tonight and participated in the debate for their interesting questions. Thank you very much. Uh, please don't forget to follow the House of European History as we have all sorts of different events online and on site all the time. And uh, of course, uh, please do visit our exhibitions uh, anytime you feel like it, especially the one we have right now on posters when walls talk. Once again, thanks a lot.